The European football season kicks off. We preview the season ahead, who will win, who will lose, and what can fans expect. Hello, I'm Arnon Naidu, and this is The Heat. World Cup enthusiasm carries into this year's European football season. A short off-season that saw France bring home the World Cup now ends as players hit the pitch for their clubs. The first games of the season concluded late Friday with Marseille topping Toulouse in a 4-0 route in France. And Manchester United edged out Leicester City 2-1 in the first game of the English Premier League. Now, football is the most popular sport in the world with more than 4 billion fans. And Manchester United is the team with the most fans in all corners of the world. And I bet they're excited about today's opening game. Other top teams like Spain's Real Madrid and Barcelona also draw major international attention. La Liga kicks off next week. So what can fans, players and football watchers expect from the 2018-2019 season? Here now for more, Tim Vickery is the football journalist based in Rio de Janeiro. With us in the studio, Wang Guan is a correspondent and presenter here at CGTN and a football enthusiast. Kate Delaney joins us from Dallas. She's the host of the Kate Delaney Show on NBC Sports Radio and a longtime sports reporter. And with us on set is Charles Bohm, a contributing editor at MLSsoccer.com. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Tim, let's start in Rio in Brazil, a place some people call the spiritual home of football. So we've just had the World Cup, still fresh in our minds, that big French win. England came very close, but not close enough. But now we have the European season just about to open. The EPL's already opened. What are your expectations ahead of the big season? Well, I think it's uh, an intriguing season because uh, we're, I think we're entering a new era, perhaps both individually and collectively. The team that has ruled the roost in recent years has been Real Madrid. But since the end of last season, Cristiano Ronaldo, the star player, has moved on to another club, to Juventus in Italy. The coach, Zinedine Zidane, has stepped down. So it's a new Real Madrid. Are they still going to be as strong? Who else is going to challenge them? So we have a question mark there. We also have a question mark individually. The era of the domination of Cristiano Ronaldo and of Lionel Messi of Barcelona is that beginning to come to an end? They can't go on forever. Surely, who is going to appear as uh, candidates for the throne of the world's best player? Is it going to be young Mbappé of Paris Saint-Germain, who had such an impressive uh, World Cup in that uh, France side that won the tournament? So I think both from an individual and a collective point of view, it's an intriguing season with lots of questions which will be answered over the course of the next nine or ten months. All right, and Tim, I guess the big question in the EPL is who's going to top Manchester City? Well, interesting that you bring that up because uh, the uh, English Premier League there is uh, almost rare, I think, in the top European leagues for the strength in depth because you have five or six teams that are competing for the title that may be able to give Manchester City a run for their money. A lot of, uh, a lot of folks tipping Liverpool this year. Um, Arsenal could be stronger. It'd be interesting to see what Chelsea come up with, even Manchester United or perhaps Tottenham. If you look at most of the major European leagues, we're looking at a scenario of dominance by one, two or at most three teams. And I wonder what this will mean for the long term of the game. All right, let's bring in Kate from Dallas. Kate, uh, looking at the upcoming season through the lens of the last World Cup, what are you expecting to see, not just here in the United States, but abroad as well? Well, I'll tell you, I think Tim made some great points. What are we going to see, especially when we talk about some of the changes with um, Real Madrid, let's say, if we go in that direction, individual versus the collective, I think is the big story there. And we saw today Paul Pogba, what's going to happen with, uh, with him? Is, is he going to stay ultimately or with that deadline looming? Does he move to Barcelona? Is there still something in the wind there? Manchester United, I think, will be much more challenging than some people think. But then, of course, there's uh, ultimately the controversy as to whether or not he stays. And then, of course, we saw Luke Shaw, who looked a lot better. I think Manchester U may be in the running for this, although if you absolutely 
said, you have to pick somebody to do this. I'm going to say it's going to be Manchester City again because we saw how easily they did it last time, maybe Liverpool. But I think it's wide open and much more interesting. Charles, sadly, the United States was not in the World Cup, but uh, I don't want to remind you all the time. But <laughs> Feel free. It is what it is, as they say. It is what it is. Um, but there was a huge following here in the World Cup. Uh, we saw that all over the country. Uh, but let's look at the league here in the United States, the MLS. Um, one big signing, Wayne Rooney going to DC United right here in the nation's capital. Uh, what does that do for football here? I think the past year or two, we're seeing an increasing uh, openness uh, as MLS joins the sort of the world market, both in terms of transfers, in terms of uh, awareness around the globe. Uh, Rooney's another example of a, of a player uh, coming, perhaps associated with the retirement league stigma, but he's still got it. He's only 32 years old. He's got a, a lot left in him, something to prove. Um, but you know, we still have this sort of it, MLS has had this sort of traditionally. Uh, awkward maybe relationship with with the rest of world football and you see it in in, in simply calendar terms right now the European leagues are kicking off and MLS is entering its stretch run playing from March uh, through to December so that alone it can, uh, kind of makes it a little bit of a different rhythm you know you raise a good point there and that is the MLS getting involved in the international market why has it taken so long the money's here isn't it well, the money is in the country, but the money has not necessarily been in the league. Uh, MLS lost enormous amounts of money, nine-figure losses in the first 10 or so years of its existence. Uh, real questions about its viability. Now we've reached a point where through stable management, expansion, uh, increasing numbers of owners, rather than having three or four billionaires bankroll the league, we have uh, an, a separate indiv uh, individual uh, ownership groups for each club, and, and, the, and the league is rapidly growing. So for example, Atlanta United are the current league leaders. They've not only changed the game on the field with the signings and the style of play, but their owner, from the Arthur Blank, from the moment he arrived in the league, signaled his ambition. He was ready to spend. He was ready to build infrastructure. He was ready to go and enter the transfer market by uh, signing talented South Americans and, and, and possibly flipping them after, after finding success on the field. So I think you're seeing the, the, the rise of spending and ambition uh, kind of slowly but surely drag this sustainability-minded league into the, the, the modern uh, arena. Wang Guan, China wasn't in the World Cup, but uh, how big uh, well, it was the World Cup? has only been once, <laughs> sadly. <Right. laughs> but how big was the World Cup in China? Uh, it's huge. Um, I can tell you uh, half of Brazil's uh, national squad or yeah. players who played or have been or are playing in Brazil are in China. We have Hulk, we have Oscar, yeah. uh, we have Tao Deli. Um, we have uh, lots of uh, European players who may have passed their primes are now playing in China. Uh, it's a huge market. It's where the money is. It's where the passion is. Um, you know, with the China's uh, going abroad uh, strategy of its firms, um, you know, it, it's it one on a, a spending spree. Uh, we acquired AC Milan, we acquired Atletico Madrid in the past uh, two years. And also, if you look at the World Cup in Russia, uh, all the billboards, the advertisement, are, uh, half of them are Chinese. It's because uh, lots of Chinese firms, along with China's economic rise, have all the cash to burn in terms of marketing, in terms of uh, doing publicity. So lots of money around. And also, uh, China is a big football nation. Uh, this may sound counterintuitive. But a um, huge football fan base. In this Ru Russia World Cup, uh, nearly 400 million clicks or views every single day for CCTV sports, uh, sports' multiple platforms. It's our sister network. So a big following, 850 million fans following them on uh, WeChat. So China is very big. I mean, it's got very ambitious plans. Its plans backed right up to the top. President Xi Jinping has said he wants China to be a world football power by 2050. And we could be seeing big players coming out of China much sooner. Um, but what about chi the Chinese following uh, for the European leagues, the EPL for one, uh, other leagues in Europe? It has been huge. Uh, you know, when I often get, get, get to ask this question, why are Chinese so enthusiastic about football? Because back in the 90s, when China just opened its border, um, the only live sporting event that we can watch was Serie uh, Serie A of Italy, so that's the, our first exposure to live uh, sporting event or live anything. So for five, four or five years, we watched uh, Italian uh, football, and then it was Bundesliga, but it didn't quite get as big. And then it was English Premier League, so it was huge, and uh, the craze for football coincided with the rise of China's English language education. So 100 million people speak English as a second language. I think that really. Uh, explained the enthusiasm of the Chinese fans for their English Premier League in particular. And 
I think Man United's biggest following outside of Manchester <laughs> is I actually know it's your in team. China. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I have another team that I prefer, but yes, Manchester United. Tim, you were talking earlier on about you know, the fact that we probably have seen the last of uh, Ronaldo and Lionel Messi in the World Cup. And uh, you mentioned the new players that we're now seeing, people like uh, Kylian Mbappe, Benjamin Pavard. And I'm wondering to what extent is this uh, changing of the guard in international football a turning point? Well, yeah, I well, think it, it that, could well um, be. What fascinates me is, is, is whether in the future we're going to be having superstars produced in China or superstars produced in the United States. Um, the, uh, if you look back at the last 35 years of football, the game has changed so much because of the influence of television. It's globalised, but it's globalised on European terms, where Europe brings in players from the four corners of the globe, puts them in its major leagues, and sells that spectacle to the world. Well, now I'm, I'm fascinated hearing about the growth of major league soccer, the growth of football in China. Are we moving towards a more multipolarized football world where China is producing players, where the United States is producing players, where Major League Soccer and, and, and the league in China can be alternate poles to football in Europe? Do people think that's where we're going? Because that, that is a question which I think is fundamental to the future of the game. Kate, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was going to, uh, I'm sorry to step in there, That's I was fine. chomping yeah. at the bit, but I think he nailed it exactly. We're seeing the globalization and the feeder system, if that also becomes what happens with the MLS, I think that just um, grows even bigger, the love for football, European style, obviously, because not to be confused with American football, which gets underway in another month or so. And I think in the United States, that's kind of where we butt heads with um, American football versus what we would call, obviously, soccer. But to what Charles's point was before, the MLS now with varied owners, I think it gives it a better chance, better marketing, uh, better ways to attract some of these kids that are involved in soccer. And I think it's complete globalization. And Kate, to what extent is this going to be driven by the fact that there is so much interest now on the part of the big television networks, like NBC, for instance, uh, spending huge sums of money to bring the World Cup uh, to uh, the United States, also bringing European soccer here, football here? Yeah, I think NBC is a great example. I just talked to some executives from the network, in fact, about me doing more football and getting involved with the Premier League a little bit more and giving out um, scores and more in-depth analysis. And there's definitely a need, I think, to feed that. And they feel as though that the next generation, the, the, uh, the globals, if you will, or even millennials right before them, um, have an interest in it because they're participatory and they play the game of soccer and you're seeing it more and more. And Charles, to Tim's point that we could see the big names in international soccer in the future possibly come from the United States. Where do you see that brewing? Where do you see it coming from? Yes, again, sort of a, a, alongside the growth of uh, the, the transfer market, I mean, some of that is, is selling abroad. We just saw a, a, a Canadian player by the name of Alfonso Davies. Liber incredible story, actually. Born in a Ghanaian refugee camp to Liberian parents, grew up in Edmonton, Canada, was spotted by the Vancouver Whitecaps uh, as a, I believe, 14, 13, 14-year-old. 14 now he's only 17, and he just broke the MLS transfer record, sold to Bayern Munich for a deal that could rise as high as 22 million U.S. dollars. So, and this is, again, Bayern Munich spends that sort of money uh, on a regular basis in their sleep almost. But the fact that we saw that record fall, it's that it was Josie Altidore was a previous holder of that. Um, that tells you that the, the tide is turning a bit, that there's an awakening understanding that there is talent, premium talent in the United States and Canada away, away from Europe, away from the traditional uh, hotbeds of the game that could be found at, perhaps at a bargain even relative to, to the, the traditional scouting sites. Speaking of Bayern Munich, uh, the president of Bayern Munich actually has said that uh, one of the, uh, what he wants to do was break into the Chinese market, the fan market, and one of the ways to do that is to buy a player from China. Well, I would say that's, uh, that's more difficult than people think uh, because, for one thing, the United States is a country of immigrants. Uh, they have players of all descents uh, from Africa, from the Middle East, from Europe. But in China, China still doesn't recognize dual citizenship. 
So meaning, um, let's, let's put it bluntly, a black player or a white player cannot that easily become a Chinese national and then play for but Team what about China. A Chinese player, say, being that, yeah, that yeah. would be our only hope. Yeah. Uh, that is, we have more homegrown mm -hmm. efforts, homegrown players. Um, but in that regard, we're not quite there yet. You know, the other year, I talked to one of China's most respected sports analysts, uh, Zhang Lu, and he told me that uh, four years ago there were as few as 20,000 young people who regularly or professionally train and play soccer, uh, because pe parents don't allow their kids to play soccer anymore. Uh, China is a country that really respects uh, scholarship. So go to school, get great score, um, be somebody, um, go to politics, but don't play soccer. But that's changing, isn't it? Because we're now seeing the growth of uh, football academies in China. Um, we had, um, I, I, I can't remember the name of the team right now, but they signed an education agreement right. with Peking University. Uh, I have it somewhere here. Um, Barcelona signed an education agreement. Yeah, in the past four years, that's where I was going. Uh, in the past four years, things changed. I think thanks in part because uh, our president um, himself is a football fan. What about uh, the Chinese Super League? How big is that? How big a following does it have in China? Uh, that's huge, but uh, I would say that many Chinese fans still, um, their favorite teams are still in Europe. And they still prefer Barcelona or Manchester United. Of course, uh, their home teams are very dear to their heart. But uh, on the back of their mind, they know that uh, the Chinese teams are not quite on par with their, those European counterparts. Go ahead. Now, I think many of us around the world look at some of this, the economies of scale that, that China can call on uh, and are amazed and even a little bit wor worried at the long-term impacts it could have. What's it, 10,000 footballing academies being built ar around the country? It seems as if with this governmental push, it seems it could have enormous long-term uh, benefits to be reaped. Yeah, well, well, we thought that the numbers are there, but uh, there are some systematic problems. For example, game fixing, corruption. Uh, it's pandemic across the Chinese society. So when they reaches football, it takes the form of game fixing. For example, half a dozen of China's football team in 2002, the only time that China made it to the World Cup, were imprisoned, were jailed uh, after the World Cup because they were investigated and they were, they were uh, prosecuted and convicted of match fixing. So if we don't fix those cultural or societal problems or issues, it's very hard for China to have a, uh, you know, a, a very healthy and a football culture. Tim, I want to get back to the upcoming season. And we talked earlier on about uh, some of the transfers in uh, Europe. We had, of course, the big transfer, and that was Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo going from Real Madrid to Juventus. In fact, there's a joke going around that uh, Juventus got a really good deal there. They paid 100 million euro for Ronaldo and they got 70% of Real's fans as well. Um, but what were the other big moves? Well, there's, uh, from a Brazilian point of view, there is one that maybe hasn't attracted so many headlines, but I'll be very interested in, in that. And that's a young Brazilian midfielder called Arthur who's gone from Grêmio here in Brazil to Barcelona. Now, he's the type of player, a type of central midfielder that Brazilian football perhaps hasn't produced for a while and uh, maybe the type of player that Brazil were missing in the recent World Cup. He uh, reminds one quite a lot of a young Andres Iniesta who wore that Barcelona shirt with such distinct distinction before his, uh, his recent move to Japan. So I'll be very, very intrigued to see if Artur can make the step up from South American football to, uh, to top-class European football. And again, from a Brazilian perspective, it's not a transfer, or at least not yet, but it's one thing that I'm especially intrigued with with the new season, is Neymar, the Brazilian star, who a year ago left Barcelona for Paris Saint-Germain uh, in a bid to get out of the shadow of Lionel Messi and be voted the world's best player. At the moment, that project has totally been blown off course. Uh, he comes out of the World Cup, although he didn't play particularly badly, but he comes out of the World Cup as something of a laughing stock because of his diving and his antics. And also, with Mbappé doing so well for France, you wonder if uh, Neymar is even the best player in his own team at the moment. So let's see how Neymar reacts in this season for Paris Saint-Germain. That's one of the things which will be attracting a lot of attention on this side of the Atlantic. Tim, talking about the reception that uh, Neymar got, uh, back in Brazil. What are the team as a whole? What kind of reception did they receive when they went back home after the World Cup? They, they've uh, awarded the coach a new contract. That doesn't often happen after Brazil are beaten in a World Cup. Uh, that shows a certain amount of approval, obviously, for his, his work. But, you know, in, in Brazil, really, there are only two possible results in a World Cup. 
Either you win it or you lose it. It's like heads or tails in a contest that includes 32, uh, 32 uh, uh, countries. So I feel a little bit sad for them, you know, in a way, because it's so hard for them to enjoy the ride. Because unless you win it, the whole thing is, 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 is a defeat. Uh, I was back in England for the last week of the World Cup, and I enjoyed the semi-final there with England losing against Croatia. But there was a real feel from the English public that they were enjoying the ride, win or lose at the end. In Brazil, because the expectations are so high, it's difficult to really enjoy the ride unless you bring that trophy home. Kate, here in the United States, we get a lot of the big European teams uh, coming here to play, mostly exhibition matches, but I've heard two complaints about that. One is that it's very expensive to go to those games. The other is that in many instances, managers are not very keen to showcase their big stars because these are exhibition games. They don't want to take a chance. Players could get injured. Uh, but how does that help the game here in the United States? No, I think it's a big mistake because Americans especially want to see the superstars. So if you were to compare, um, for example, if you took the Lakers and you didn't have LeBron James playing in Europe in an exhibition game or playing somewhere else uh, outside of the United States where, where the NBA was trying to get more traction, which, by the way, they want to be as global as possible, you have to have the superstars, and especially in the United States, because Americans like the names. They know the names, and that's who they want to see. So if they want to get more interest, then they have to, the managers have to be willing to play the, the big names. What is your feeling on that, Charles, getting the big teams from Europe to come here more often? Well, we've seen the, the international friendly sort of cycle uh, turn into something more formalized with the International Champions Cup, which is an attempt to make it more of a, a, a tournament. Uh, inevitably, this has limitations because we're still talking about uh, the preseason for these teams. And with the combination of, uh, of the high prices that you mentioned and the, the World Cup forcing some of the big stars not to take part because of the FIFA rules about rest, uh, they sort of topped out. We, we saw some really small crowds. There were still enormous crowds. I think they had 100,000 plus for a game in Michigan. Um, but in other places, 16, 17,000, really, really underwhelming crowds. So um, there's a little bit of a, I think, a, a reckoning perhaps coming. These, these clubs realize you can't just slap your shirts on just any player that's on your, your roster. The American fan is more uh, intelligent, a little more cultured than they once were. And so you have to bring the stars. You have to give a little bit more weight to these occasions, to, especially to charge the premium prices that they do. Can I say something? Um, you know, the West, the European players uh, and the top European teams have been coming to China for, for like forever, since uh, 30 years ago, back in the 90s. So when the AC Milan and Sampdoria of Italy went to China, and but those matches became laughing stocks because uh, China na Chinese national team beat those teams. Why? Because those starting players were not really starting. They used the, all the bench players. Uh, you know, it was um, a publicity stunt. It was more for marketing. So, you know, those European teams have been going to China, but I don't think they can do a whole lot to uh, help uh, with China's uh, domestic levels. Um, really, at the end of the day, it's about uh, our homegrown efforts. Go ahead. Here's something else to watch. Uh, there's several European leagues have sort of probed at the idea of ho holding actual league matches or cut matches, official competitive matches outside of their own countries in a place like China or, or in the United States. There's some limitations. FIFA doesn't always uh, look kindly upon those sorts of things, but there's real money to be made there, and I think that's the next step. Can they loosen up the rules but to allow that But it can be done. Happen? Rugby does it. I mean, they, they have teams traveling from one continent to the other. <laughs> it's true. The, again, the question is, and I think, I think uh, the French League played their Super Cup, perhaps, was it in yeah, China, China recently? China last week. Yeah. Um, that's definitely progress, I think, and the fans are craving that. But you, the, there's always a risk that you'll be perceived to be sort of watering down the competition or tainting the traditions uh, or the, 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 the integrity of your competition. So there's definitely a push-pull here between the old ways and, and the, the sort of the, the modern football's chase for, for new frontiers and new riches. Tim, let's talk about football in Africa. Some of the biggest players in the World Cup we saw came from Africa. In fact, there was a big controversy over the fact that the French team was African. You remember that? Uh, Trevor Noah of The Daily Show uh, said that. That was an African team that was playing. The French ambassador here in Washington was upset about that and said, no, they were French. But here we have some of the biggest players coming out of Africa, coming out of Senegal, Cameroon, uh, Algeria, Egypt as well. Um, but we don't see the leagues in those countries doing so well. Do the international football authorities need to focus more on those countries, invest more there? Yeah, and I think that this process of globalization can make it very, very difficult for leagues in the peripheries. And here in South America, for example, uh, much more established football than, than in Africa, 
But it, the, the game here in South America has just become an export industry. Now, it used to be, uh, used to be sugar or coffee. Now it's footballers. Um, so uh, the local football ends up selling it, its stars rather than selling its spectacle. And I think that that's even more true of leagues in Africa that don't have the same tradition. It's very, very hard to strengthen domestic football in the era of globalization. Because uh, uh, what I hear of so many people in Africa are more concerned with Chelsea in the English Premier League than they are with their own domestic uh, uh, um, club. And that obviously is counterproductive. That's why I, I look with certain dim eyes on this idea of taking English Premier League games to other countries. Uh, as well as taking the game away from its original fans, it's also, I would doubt, um, its beneficial effect on the game in the countries where you're taking these, the, these games to. Because how can the local teams compete if they've got the global giants coming and winning supporters? So it's very, very hard, I think, in this globalised era where everyone can sit and watch Real Madrid and Barcelona and Manchester United. It's very hard for football to develop all around the world. And Kate, you know, you have this anomaly here in the United States. I don't know how one explains it, but take women's football in the United States, one of the best teams in the world. Uh, how does one explain that against the fact that the men's team is not as great as the women's team? Boy, it's such a, it's that, that's the million dollar question. And honestly, I think that's a, a huge problem. If you look at, um, for example, the ratings for France and Croatia, for all of us who love the great game of football, AKA soccer right. here in the United States, we watched, but you had what, 11.3 million watching the final on Fox. And I think that Americans get even more involved if would get more involved when the men are better and we've seen that before i think part of the problem is you've got some great kids that get lost in all of this and charles could probably talk to that right. who are inner city kids who aren't on some of these clubs and don't get fed into the system where maybe they could be seen and groomed a little bit more charles very quickly i'm going to go around i've got about 40 seconds left 10 seconds each what's your biggest prediction for the upcoming season around the world well, I think, I think Real Madrid, after years of dominance in the Champions League, they're going to have to give up the crown. We'll see a new champion in UEFA. Tim Vickery? Always make your predictions after the event. <laughs> but I hope at the end of the season, football has done its silent work to make friends and bring people together. Because that, that's the most important side, as far as I'm concerned. OK, Kate, what's your biggest prediction? My biggest prediction is that Stan Kroenke, who All now right. is involved with the Arsenal and dumped so much money into it, and that whole privatization thing is going to cause a bit of a stir. And maybe uh, Arsenal will end up uh, higher up there than many people think. I think they're predicted third right now. I'd like them to do a little bit better. Okay, one one. Ten seconds. I think seconds. there will be a revival of Serie A, of Italian football. Okay, we shall see. Well, big player's going to Juventus, right? <laughs> That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arun Gnaidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.